receive an honorable doctorate from Whittier College. A school named after one of this country's beloved poets is more than an honor. It is an inspiring recognition. Today, you are not just embracing my past accomplishments, you are putting trust in the work that lies ahead. And this not only encourages me to continue writing, but also propels the promise of my dreams and my quest for beauty and poetry, what I call the long road into the world of creation. The act of receiving is as intricate and delicate as the creative art of giving. Besides offering a gratifying and joyous moment, it is a humbling and demanding experience, given that we must be prepared to cherish and value what is being conferred upon us. It is not difficult for an artist to recognize the art of receiving, since part of the creative process is about welcoming the muse and accepting the gift of inspiration, the arrival of beauty, this most sacred presence, which causes us to bow our heads in reverence. For this reason, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude in Spanish, the language in which I first learned to be thankful, since the word gracias not only bestows grace upon the giver, it offers a blessing, the benevolent gift of beauty to the benefactor. On the occasion of receiving this honor, let me tell you that if very early on I was seduced by poetry and literature engaged me first as a lover of words, then as a writer, all this happened from the contagion of beauty after I read a poem by Emily Dickinson. As green and naive as it may seem, I must confess that my attitude towards writing is still comprised of that initial moment when I experience that exalting presence of the beautiful, and I surrender to those primal virtues which are com comprised of innocence and curiosity, those inherent qualities which incite exploration and provoke that ancient desire in us to duplicate what we have witnessed. And why deny it? The emergence of beauty always gives rise to that instinct so inherent in mankind in nature, which causes a poet to echo the steps of music, or makes a butterfly flutter from flower to flower in an immersion of color and aroma. Beauty is an invitation, a salutation. Besides offering the perceiver a sense of mystery and intrigue, it confers conviction, it grants an affirmation of existence. It is truly a shaft of life. The essence of art is indeed order, because there's nothing more orderly than beauty, an aria by Puccini is sequence in voice and music, a painting by Gauguin is composition of color and form, a poem by Federico Garcia Lorca is command of meaning and obedience of words. We are living in a fast-paced world that praises the material and promotes artificiality and multiplicity. The dominant culture with its invisible tentacles proclaims a certain kind of colonialism that assigns commercialism as the only form of art. This culture that thrives on the banal invites us to confuse our direct vision of truth and in individuality to the point that we are not able to recognize the regenerative power and order of beauty. But a true artist will not fall for the lies a true artist will not aspire to be a prisoner of resignation. A true artist will recognize that mediocrity has a way of masking itself and claiming reality by creating disorder and displacement. A true artist will always denounce fear and will never put up with, the res with, with restriction. <coughs> and he will go as far as to divorce himself from his religion, his nation, his family, the burden of race, the cause and effect of politics in order to show the world the creative force of art and the equanimity of beauty. Actually, <laughs> the struggles of an artist are equivalent to the efforts of an asylum seeker who tries to find a better place to exercise his freedom. I am an emigre. Not only because I left my country of birth very early in my life, but because of my own volition as an artist and for the obvious reason that I refuse to be a part of a system that dictates how I should convey the world through art. I am an emigre. Due to my desire to celebrate the dignity of life 
because beauty resides in the, valid in the validity and fairness of expression. And beauty would not be beautiful if it didn't have the freedom of order, and it wouldn't be just if it didn't have any justice. Now, my friends, the difference between an emigre and the migrant is that the asylum seeker has less options to return of returning to his homeland. And yet, I go back to my country of birth. I go back to Cuba all the time, through the writing, through my plays. I go back to a mythic island, perhaps made up of nostalgia and memories. A very private island, recreated within the boundaries of the imagination, through the, the regenerative force of art and the newness of beauty. And not only do my place allow me to return to the place where I was born, they permit me to travel to lands I have never been before, such a, a war-torn country in Latin America, or the south of Spain during the Spanish Civil War, where I was able to denounce the terrible crime committed against a great poet. The kind of theater I write usually, if not always, explores and interrogates, interrogates displacement, gender and corruption of power. Elements of romance, fantasy, and surreal landscapes reflect the lives of my characters, men and women who pursue their dreams, children who are escaping the poverty of their existence, human creations that believe that hope dies last. More than anything, I'm interested in rescuing the lyrical and bringing it back to the theater. But I must tell you, that living between two languages always gives me cause to struggle with words and agonize over sentences. This, of course, is not a terrible thing, since writing is about not being able to encounter the word, but the essence of what we find along the way. Writing is about trying to contain the light that accompanies words, the star that glows in the palm of our hands, which sometimes can be dim and gentle but it can also be incandescent as a comet and burn with the unseen fire of an ember. As writers, we cannot truly capture light, but we can come close to describing its presence and mystery with our photographic memory. And with the same urgency that we shout to a friend to witness the fall of a shooting star. In the past, I have experimented with other mediums of art to help me find order in the writing. Since theater is so ephemeral and it operates in a third dimension, making visual collages and illustrating boxes with images and objects have been extremely instrumental in offering me something solid and concrete as I try to capture the evanescent form of a play. Theater is, a very, is very difficult to write because it unfolds with the passage of time, and my boxes, my collages, these other means of creation have prompted ruminations and a sense of composition, which are invaluable components of the artistic process. In reality, these artifacts are like little altars that incite inspiration and allow me to enter the order of things. They are like mandalas used in Buddhism as a sacred space for meditation practices, since they focus my attention and transport me into another dimension where, where I encounter characters and the universe they live in. It is true that creativity invites adventure, exploration beyond our boundaries or comfort zone. A poem inspires a painting, a painting, a novel, a novel, a movie, a movie, a music score. In my latest excursions as a playwright, I am experimenting with narrative to explore dramatic situations and atmosphere, something that I've never done before because it is a long and tedious approach, something that I don't really recommend to my students when I teach. But rules are meant to be broken, and this method lets me examine the sentiments, passions, and the unconscious and subconscious world of my characters in a different way. Then, later, I distill all the narrative into action, since all that matters in, the in theater is that, life, is that life that happens between dialogues, which reveals the soul of the characters, the true dimension and scope of the spirit. The only problem? I face at the moment is that I have enough material for a novel and a play. <laughs> and these two versions of the same story are competing for my attention. In The Color of Desire, how the play is called, or The Obedience of Desire in narrative form, I am trying to recapture the year 1960 when I was born, 
It is not a biographical play, but there is always something of the personal in my work. Needless to say, I've had to do a lot of research, but an early memory of when I was a boy has allowed me to transfer that experience to the opening section of the narrative. I was first exposed to the world of the performing arts through dance in Cuba. I was eight years old and I was vacationing with my family at a sea resort. In the evening, everyone loved going to the hotel's cabaret to dance and see the show. This meant that, some of the, some, that none of my family members wanted to stay in their room and watch over me, including my grandmother. <laughs> so one evening, my father said, we'll take him to the cabaret tonight. I have some friends there, we'll sneak him through the kitchen, and they did. They sneak me through the kitchen and basically hid me under the cabaret table where my family was sitting, which was covered in a white cloth. Then, when the lights went off and the show started, I lifted the tablecloth, and for the first time, I, I got to experience the magic of dance. And I was in complete awe. It was indeed, indeed an astounding and intoxicating experience for an eight-year-old heart. The waiter, of course, saw me and said, it's okay, let him stay. <laughs> when the vacation was over and I went back home, I gathered my neighborhood friends, hung up a couple of sheets in my grandmother's patio, and I tried to recreate what I had seen. But now, years later, I have found a way of capturing that world through the writing. And tonight, if you don't mind, I would love to share just a little bit of this uh, narrative. And this is from the Obedience of Desire. Belen Morel has just entered the night. The young woman has stepped onto the outdoor space of the Tropicana nightclub in Havana. From where she is, she can see how the moon has invaded this part of the cabaret, accommodating patrons and how a blue cloud of smoke has shrouded the festive locale. The nightclub is inundated with music, joy, laughter, and chatter. The contagious sound of dry seeds and wood is everywhere. The echoing throb of the drums is extending, expanding, streaming through everything. The brassy tunes of trumpets are piercing the air, penetrating glasses of rum and silver buckets filled with champagne bottles. The music is under the green skirt of a woman who dances a rumba. It is gleaming on the gold tooth of a man who is laughing. There it is entering the powdered cleavage of a woman who is wearing a satin dress and is fanning herself. You can sense it in the perfumed white handkerchief of a man who is drying the, the sweat from his forehead. The music is also there in the embraces in the mouths of lovers that want to melt into one. We see Belen Morel looking for the American man in the crowd, in the music. She's searching for the foreigner who usually wears white linen suits the one she met at the Montmartre nightclub a few nights ago, the stranger who reminds her of the Hollywood actor John Garfield. The music of the Tropicana continues to permeate everything. It has lured a group of militiamen into the open space and is seducing the men in uniform. It is now imbibing the sweat of their necks and feeding off the heat of their bodies as they dance feverishly with a few voluptuous girls that are regulars of the club. The seductive melody has made these men forget their olive green fatigues and the revolvers that hang from their leather belts. They're oblivious of being soldiers and have forgotten what they were willing to give up for their country. Belen Morel's eyes haven't adapted yet to the semi-darkness of the candlelit garden, to all the festive commotion that surrounds her. No, nor has she gotten accustomed to the military presence in all the nightclubs of Havana. The green uniforms that bring a state of dismay to her being, the constant reminder that her country is still in a state of turmoil. The American men have already spotted her, but the young woman doesn't know she's being watched from a distance. Belen Morel is wearing an elegant champagne colored dress, her hair is pulled back in a bun, and her skin reflects the presence of summer, the tropical light that at night gives her a faint iridescent glow. The American man signals her from his table, and the young woman begins to cross the, the crowded dance floor. The music is inviting her to dance, and why ignore the sweet melody? Why deny its course in her body when it's actually punctuating her steps and freeing her hips as she strides through the sea of dancers? 
The young woman, the young, the young woman arrives at the table and now faces the American man, but she doesn't know how to greet him, and she resorts to a mindless chatter to, to dissimulate the awkward moment of meeting someone she's not familiar with. With, I was looking for you at the bar. I couldn't find you. She says nervously. There's a line of people waiting to get into the club. It took me forever to get here. I couldn't find a taxi. She can't stop talking. The American man extends his hand and pats her gently on the shoulder, letting her know that he's not bothered by her tardiness. Actually, he is delighted to see her, and he and all he wants is an effortless smile. We could never guess what number of years to assign Preston Thomas. Is he in, mid, in his mid-forties? His face has, has started to lose its freshness, or should we say, it has withered considerably over the past year. The man from Portland, Maine, is only 38, but now his youthful looks are noticeably fading, and he has begun to resemble more a man in his mid-40s. Belen Morel visualized this moment with the American man before she entered the night. She had prepared for it by talking with her, with her own image in front of the mirror. She pronounced all the words she would use in the conversation, and she bothered her face and her neck. She had practiced the punctual smiles she would offer him as she dabbed Molinar perfume behind her ear, her ear and her bosom. A new melody begins to play. The bolero, Lágrimas Negras, reaches their table. Preston Thomas asks the young woman to dance and she consents. They go up to the dance floor and they enter the music as if they were two old dancers who were well acquainted with, with each other's bodies. They dance within the periphery of the floor tile with only the necessary distance between them to let the music slip by and crush and cross the threshold of their bodies, the deeper recess of their beings. The young woman knows the song quite well, and she hums it as she dances in the arms of the American man. She is thinking that President Thomas is probably one of the few Americans left on the island, or perhaps the very last one. But she rectifies her penultimate thought since Washington and Havana haven't broken their relationships just yet, and the American embassy hasn't closed its doors. Preston Thomas wants to know if it's true what their mutual friend, Hema Poncel, has told him about Belen. Is she really an actress? Yes, I am, she tells him. I've been in a few plays. Most recently, I got to play Antigone, and last year, Sonia in Chekhov's Uncle Vanya. He smiles as he compliments her. Ah! I know those plays quite well, but you're a star. Oh no, far from it. Belen Morel does not belong to the lively and enthusiastic group of actors who are constantly demanding attention and showing off their talents. Due to her gentle nature and her propensity towards melancholy, theater directors are more inclined to cast her in the roles like Ophelia in Hamlet or the forlorn Laura in The Glass Menagerie. That's right. Her modest, demeanor in, in her, modest, her modest demeanor informs her ability to play these roles. The fact that she's even uncomfortable calling herself an actress and prefers to be seen as an artisan of the theater renders her participation in life. The actress is saying all the things that President Thomas wants to hear. He admires how discreet she is. He respects her unassuming, her unassuming personality. The American man wonders how old she is but he doesn't dare ask. It's not proper for a gentleman to pose this question to a woman, and certainly not on the first rendezvous. His guess is that she might be very young, less than 20 perhaps. He tells her that she must have an old soul to take on such complicated roles, especially the weight of Antigone's despair. The young actress wants to know why Preston is interested in, in her acting ability. Preston Thomas whispers in her ear that he's been looking for an actress for some time, someone who has experience in the theater. Belen Morel questions if that's why he was interested in meeting her. Yes, that's one reason, yes, he can't deny it. And the other, she asks, because you remind me of someone I used to know. The actress wishes to know who that someone might be, but she much rather not ask, since the night seems to be heading in another direction, and the evening is not the same as the one contained in her mirror. Preston Thomas whispers in her ear that she would have to play a woman who was part of his past. This is when Belen Morel realizes that the woman he's asking her to play has to be someone he loves. This is when she comes to, the tr to terms that he's not really interested in seeing her for who 
she is. He must think she's a call girl. But what what gave him that impression? Is it because she frequents the clubs without a chaperone? These are the musings and assumptions of a young woman whose sky has started to cloud. These are merely the hypotheses of a young actress whose nature and process in the art of acting incline her to a vulnerable state when faced with a new role. And now we must pause for the punctual tear that is about to stream down her face, revealing her sense of, of inferiority in front of the American man, since it's moments like this that she wishes she could place her eyes inside a pill box. But she's an actress, and she's capable of disguising the disenchantment that assails her. This is an example of the narrative that later becomes only two or three pages in a play. But I'm not the only one who engages in the long road to the creative process. Emile Sola was known to keep notebooks of his characters, in which he wrote down everything from the shape of their eyebrows to the dirt on their fingernails. I know I must seem old-fashioned, but I adore being immersed in the world of my characters and finding a way into the depths of their being. And we have to remember that an artist is responsible not only for documenting our presence as citizens of the world, but we should preserve the human being's highest attributes, and we can only do this through observation and exploration. In closing, I would like to address a question that was asked by a young man when I was last here at your school. I believe the question had to do with spirituality in place, and I just remember giving him a long-winded answer. And not being satisfied with my response, because this is not something I think about all the time, I, be I believe, uh, and this is not something I think all the time, <laughs> I believe spirituality is always there in comedies, in tragedies. The fact that through theater we enable our audience to laugh and cry, to get in touch with their feelings and see the world in a different light, where we can help them escape reality, the reality of their lives. A rich man can all of a sudden identify with the poverty of existence of the working class. A poor man can look into the life of a king and realize that a man of power has also a cross to bear. In other words, through theater, we have the capacity to get our audience in touch with humanity, or should we say their own humanity? And when a person gets in touch with his humanity, he gets in touch with his own spirituality, his higher self. Beauty gives us an, an indication of eternity, because beauty restores life when a poet arranges words and makes us see things in a different light, in a new and refreshing way. Gracias. And good luck to the students at Whittier. Sorry for taking you on that long ride to, to Havana. <laughs> I tried to edit it, I didn't know how to edit it. <laughs> But I think it's important because it is, you know, this is, this is something new for me where I'm writing pages and pages of not just uh, um, what I consider to be just a simple uh, narrative, but to also embrace that form of art and, uh, and through that form of art uh, discover uh, my play. And it's very interesting what I've been going through as of late with this process because the narrative is informing the play, and the play is informing the narrative. And I think the play has gone a little bit ahead of the narrative, <laughs> because of course I have uh, an e it, it has an immediate need because I there's a theater company who wants to produce it, and I've also had several workshops in uh, uh, in this country. So uh, I can't wait to finish the play and then go back to the narrative and hopefully uh, make it into a. Uh, a full uh, uh, novel. But that's just where I'm at right now.